All right, welcome everyone. In the interest of time, we can go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the Environmental Law Institute's webinar, Managing Threats to America's Beaches from Storms and Rising Seas. This is a follow-up webinar to a program we held last week, Sustaining Coastal Wetlands in the Time of Severe uh, Storms and Rising Seas. We will put the link in the chat to last week's event in case you were unable to make it and would like to watch the recording. My name is Madison Calhoun. I'm the Senior Manager of Educational Programs here at ELI. I wanted to give you a warm welcome to today's event and thank you for joining us today. We appreciate your time. I also wanna give a huge thanks to our fantastic speakers who have put time and energy into preparing a great program for you all today. Thank you so much to our speakers for joining us. There will be time at the end of today's event for questions. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You do not need to wait until the end though. Um, please go ahead and submit your questions as soon as you think of them through Zoom's Q&A function. Should you have any technical issues during the webinar, please message me or send an email to calhoun at eli.org. And with that, I will hand things over to our wonderful moderator, Jeff Peterson. Jeff works with the Coastal Flood Resilience Project, a coalition of organizations working to prepare for more severe storms and rising sea level across the U.S. coast. He's also the author of A New Coast, Strategies for Responding to Devastating so Storms and Rising Seas. Over to you, Jeff, and thank you all so much. Thank you very much, Madison, and welcome, everyone. Uh, let's get right into today's webinar. Uh, our goal uh, for this afternoon is to provide you with an overview of measures and practices that will sustain beaches and beach ecosystems threatened by more severe storms and rising seas. To give everyone a common base of information about the risks that beaches face in a changing climate, we developed a read ahead document, uh, which you can find on the ELI webpage for the webinar. But before I, and before I introduce our panel, I wanna quickly summarize some of the key points to keep in mind during the webinar. I think we can all agree that the nation's beaches are a national resource of outstanding ecological, recreational, and economic value. But sadly, beaches are at risk of erosion and related damages to habitat and wildlife by storms and eventual inundation by rising sea levels. And a warming climate is causing an increase in the number of the strongest storms. The state of Florida, for example, has reported that its critically eroded beaches increased from uh, 217 miles in 1989 to over 400 miles uh, just uh, last year, mostly due to storm impact. Sea level rise, however, uh, poses the most critical risk to beaches. Uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration predicts future sea levels rising along the U.S. coast of about 1.3 feet by 2050 and around 4 feet by 2100 and up over 7 feet by 2150 in their intermediate scenario. And future sea level rise will force beaches to shift landward where geography makes this possible. Uh, where inland migration is not possible to, due to geographic features such as rocky cliffs or shorelines or uh, barriers from human development like roads or other structures, uh, beaches will be lost uh, to inundation and become open water. The International Panel on Climate Change estimates that between uh, 10,000 and 15,000 miles of sandy coasts in North America are uh, expected to retreat by about 300 feet by the year 2100. USGS has estimated losses of between six, uh, 30 and 60 percent of California beaches by 2100. Uh, in North Carolina, 14 of 17 beaches studied were expected to have eroded all the way back to the, the main road uh, on the Outer Banks. And future, the future of beaches uh, along the U.S. coast uh, will partly depend on the vagaries of storms and the rate of acceleration of uh, sea level rise at specific places. 
but the responses uh, to increasing losses of beaches uh, by government and coastal property owners will also influence the health of beaches. Simple population growth in coastal areas poses a risk to beaches because it drives up density of structures and services and population living right along the coast is expected to double by 2060. In addition, as homes and structures are increasingly recognized as being at risk of sea level rise, some property owners behind or uh, uh, around beaches will invest in protection structures such as seawalls or bulkheads and these hardened structures limit the landward migration of beaches and uh, can result in stripping away of the beach and narrowing or vanishing of beaches altogether. Finally, some local governments uh, invest in uh, beach nourishment projects to add sand to beaches, uh, often to protect high value property or uh, recreational uh, uses. These projects though involve some environmental and ecological harms and sand often washes away, making those benefits uh, temporary. So this webinar will address what we can do to protect existing beaches uh, and facilitate their landward migration. Uh, in general, the panel will be talking about three key strategies uh, to help sustain beaches and support shifting ecosystems to higher ground. Uh, first is uh, building a broader understanding of the climate change risks to coastal ecosystems among decision makers and the public. Uh, that will help build a foundation for efforts to sustain the ecosystems and, and better recognition of the risk can help provide a foundation to apply uh, some diverse measures to protect the assets. Um, a second sort of set of tools is acquisition of title or easement. Uh, and this is a key tool to protecting existing coastal ecosystems and the uplands that will become pathways for landward migration. Acquisition might be by local or state or federal governments or nonprofit organizations. And finally, a third set of tools involves local, state, and federal government um, permitting and regulations, um, permitting of coastal structures or regulations, for instance, to discourage development uh, in ecosystems and in migration pathways. Ideas and innovations in each of these three areas are coming along well, uh, but more severe storms and rising seas are also coming. So the country is really in a race to sustain existing beaches and facilitate their landward migration ahead of these risks. The Coastal Flood Resilience Project has published a white paper uh, recommending that the country respond to the threat of coastal storms and sea level rise to the nation's beaches by advancing uh, some major new initiatives uh, to, to deal with these risks. Uh, you can find that uh, the link to that paper on the read ahead document that I mentioned earlier. Now I'm delighted to introduce uh, the expert panel with deep knowledge of all of these topics. Uh, Sean Vitusik is a research oceanographer uh, and at the Pacific Coastal and Marine Science Center of the US Geological Survey, where he develops numerical models to predict coastal climate change impacts. He was born and raised in Hawaii, attended Princeton and received his PhD in civil engineering and uh, environmental engineering from Stanford. He's also a surfer. Charles Lester is the director of the Ocean and Coastal Policy Center in the Marine Science Institute at UC Santa Barbara, where he researches, writes, and advises about sea level rise, coastal resilience, and other aspects of coastal law, policy, and management. Charles previously worked for the state of California and the California Coastal Commission for 20 years including serving as the agency's fourth executive director from 2011 to 2016. 
Uh, Lauren Blickley is the Hawaii Regional Manager for Surfrider Foundation. She has worked in Hawaii for over 10 years on a range of climate change issues, focusing on research, uh, local legislation, and public outreach. And she's working to realize proactive solutions to a range of uh, coastal uh, resilience challenges. And Travis Brandon is associate professor at the Belmont University College of Law, where he writes on issues of coastal land use planning, administrative law, and environmental justice. So today's webinar is divided into three sections. First, each of the panelists will give a short presentation describing their work in this area. Then the panelists will respond to some general questions about options for protecting beaches in the face of more severe storms and rising seas. And third, we'll take questions from the audience. And as Madison said, please submit your questions through the Q&A function. Uh, with that, I would like to give the floor over to our first speaker, uh, Sean Batusik. Thanks very much, Jeff. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'll, I will request that I can control some slides if that's okay. Okay. Great. Um, thanks very much. Uh, today I'll just talk about sort of a introduction to the science of coastal erosion and it's kind of a California centric view since that's where I'm located. Uh, but the processes are are common throughout the nation's coast. We've had a pretty interesting run here in California. Um, uh, you can see a little bit of some things that have been going on on the coastal side. This is what Capitola Pier looked like a few years ago and this is what Capitola Pier looked like as of January 5th. Um, and extrapolating this forward, this is what Capitola Pier might look like in 2100. Um, I don't know if you know what, what this bottom image is from, but it's the post-apocalyptic atoll from the movie Waterworld. Um, so just kind of a joke. Um, so at the USGS, we study um, coastal hazards and Well, about, about this talk is, you know, if you're going to try to assess coastal flooding and erosion on a given beach, you know, what are the processes that you'd, you'd want to consider? And, well, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, but for the most part, this talk will focus on two major factors, um, waves and storms, uh, and sea level rise. And sea level rise is, is kind of a big one here in terms of the, the fate of the coastlines. Um, here is a a projection from, from Gary Griggs about future sea level rise in California. And there's, there's pretty big uncertainty bands that are associated with the melting of, you know, big, big ice masses like Greenland and Antarctica. But for the most part, if you look at sea level rise projections going out to 2100, they're between about a half meter and, and two and a half meters. Um, and you can imagine there'd be a pretty significant difference between a half a meter and, and two and a half meters or up, up to 10 feet of sea level rise on the coastline is going forward in the future. So this is something that we're really, really worried about and, and really interested to see what, what's gonna happen. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about um, erosion processes. In particular, this is about uh, sediment supply, how sand gets on beaches. Um, and for example, in California, there's, there's probably three major factors. One is fluvial sediment inputs, that's sediment from rivers. Here you see a, a nice satellite image of the Santa Clara River in Ventura. You see this huge sediment plume associated with a big rainfall event. So a lot of the beaches are, are sustained by these big fluvial discharge events. Um, another one um, is from eroding cliffs and dunes that the, a lot of the sand um, is, is in the, um, landward region of the beach, uh, and that sand can supply the existence of beaches um, over time, provided um, that sand is sort of available and not impounded by infrastructure or, or other things like that. Uh, and finally, there's, there's a significant portion of beach sand in California 
that is sustained by artificial beach nourishments um, from dredging of harbors or from offshore, um, particularly in Southern California. So this is a, a, just an introduction to the sediment supply. And then that supply gets moved around by a, a couple of different factors. So there's a number of factors contributing to erosion at a given beach. The biggest one is probably waves. Um, and also in the future, uh, sea level rise will be a, a pretty big factor. And of course, um, things that affect the natural sediment supply, like river damming, um, can, can affect how much sediment is delivered to the coastline or shoreline armoring, how much sand is available from um, eroding beaches or eroding dunes. Um, so looking at the wave factor a little bit more, I'm uh, just going to give some examples of how waves drive coastal change. Uh, one that you can see in the bottom is uh, longshore transport or littoral drift that waves can drive sand from, from one region to another. Here's a little just cartoon example of, of how waves can drive longshore sediment transport. Um, the ocean is basically the blue part, the sandy beach is the yellow part, and the, the in, infrastructure, in, urban infrastructure is in the um, gray. And basically what happens is whenever you have waves at an angle, they drive longshore currents and that those longshore currents can move sand. So you can have beaches that move around from shifting wave directions, as you see in sort of this example. Another example of uh, wave-driven coastal change is a, is a cross-shore equilibrium transport. Uh, basically what that means is, well, a normal beach profile looks like something like this. Uh, and then when you have large waves, the large waves often will erode the beach face and move that sand offshore into sandbars. And then once the waves get smaller, um, you can have um, that sand moving back onshore and recovery of those beaches. In California in particular, we see a very large seasonal um, excursion in the shoreline position. We have our biggest waves in the wintertime and our beaches erode back 20, 30 meters, um, and then they recover in the summertime when the waves are smaller. Uh, and finally, I'll talk a little bit about um, sea level driven coastal change, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the Brune Rule. Uh, and uh, in essence, that model basically says that the beach wants to maintain an equilibrium profile or shape, basically the, the same shape uh, as sea level rises. So the example is in this orange line, you have this beach profile, this elevation profile um, of a beach. And there's many you know, geologic and hydrodynamic reasons why that beach profile exists the way that it is. And as sea level rises, it, it wants to maintain that same shape. So if you had sea level rise <clears throat> um, and you wanted the shoreline in, in a horizontal position to stay exactly where it was, then essentially what you would need is, is you would need a volume of sand in order to maintain that same profile at a higher sea level rise state. So you, you'd need a source of sand in order to, to achieve that. When you don't have a source of sand, basically what happens instead is you have an erosion of, of the beach face or the, or the dry beach and a deposition offshore. And so in that situation, this, the sediment is all conserved. And so what it, essentially what it means is that your beach profile that used to look like the orange now looks like the red. It has migrated upward with sea level rise, but it has also migrated landward with sea level rise. And uh, the blue rule basically says the amount of coastal recession is related to the sea, sea level rise divided by the, the inverse of the, or divided by the beach slope. And for the most part, um, that generally means that the coast, amount of coastal erosion can be on the order of 20 to 50 times whatever sea level rise is. And, and this is a huge uncertainty. We, we don't know that it's 20. We don't know that it's 50. There may be some environments where it's 100. Um, there's a lot of complicated hydrodynamic and geologic processes that cause some pretty significant uncertainties in how much retreat you get uh, based on how much sea level rise you get. So um, we don't know, but we're guessing you'll get you know, a, around this amount, 20 to 50 times the recession 
uh, that you have sea level rise. So if you have one meter of sea level rise, you might have 20 to 50 meters of erosion, which is pretty significant. So at the USGS, um, we study these sort of things in a variety of different ways. I'll just give a few examples. Um, one is using aerial photos. Um, for each aerial photo, you can digitize where the shoreline used to be, and then you can look at trends in those shoreline positions over time. And the classic example of that is, is the USGS National Assessment of Shoreline Change, which is a very uh, big and important um, historical product coming out of the USGS. And we're trying to modernize that a little bit um, with, with uh, more data. Um, the advanced, advanced of um, machine learning and deep learning, artificial intelligence, um, algorithms really allow you to accurately identify things like shoreline position from satellites and satellites provide an, an incredible wealth of data above historical aerial photos. So I think this is a tremendous resource to track shoreline change over time. Um, and with those uh, satellite information, you can also integrate those with computer models um, to predict uh, potentially what the shoreline is going to look like in the future. And I'm not sure if I can click on this animation here. There should be an animation. Um, doesn't seem to be allowing me to, to, uh, to show it. Um, Let's see, does it come up? If not, then it's fine. Um, basically, what, what you would see um, from this animation is that um, we have, info oh, there we go. Let's see if that works. OK, perfect. So what we have is we have uh, wave heights for this given beach, ocean beach in San Francisco uh, that's driving the shoreline back and forth. The red is basically what our model is sort of predicting what the shoreline is. And it's not maybe doing the best job until we have a lot of observations of shoreline change to automatically calibrate that model. So the model is trying to optimize itself to best fit observations uh, or the agreement between model and observations. And then afterwards, we try to understand after we stop calibrating the model, how well it does against observations and then run that forward to the future. So this is a way that we're working on to try to predict what's going to happen to shoreline change in the future. Um, you can look at some of our um, modeling products. Um, oh, let me go back. Uh, at this Our Coast, Our Future um, um, web portal, I can post a link in the, in the chat, but it just shows some, some flood model projections and shoreline model projections for California. Uh, and we're working on trying to do this um, throughout the, the US. Uh, we basically have California already finished, and I'm hoping in a matter of weeks that we will have similar results being released for the, the South Atlantic region. We're also currently working on the sandy portions of the Gulf of Mexico, and we're working on uh, the Pacific Northwest with some folks at Oregon State University and University of Washington. We're, we're working in Hawaii with my old advisor, master's advisor, Chip Fletcher. Um, and Alaska is also something that's on our, on our to-do list in the next couple of years. We don't necessarily have plans, I think, for North Atlantic or the Great Lakes, um, but that should hopefully come uh, relatively soon. Um, so it's a, definitely an important problem to understand what's going to happen with future coastal erosion and coastal flooding, and, and we're trying our best to work on that at the USGS. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you very much, um, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you, Sean. That, that gives everybody a great introduction to um, really complicated beach dynamics. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, let's turn now to Charles Lester. I'll hand the floor to you, Charles. Thank you, uh, Jeff. It's uh, great to be here today. And um, I think I've taken control. Um, 
Let's see if the slides advance. Ah, extras, Sean's extras. <laughs> I agree there's a myth and reality of these beaches. How many of these are there, Sean? <laughs> yeah, there might be way too many, so you might have to go by pretty quick. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. Okay, so um, as I said, Jeff, it's great to be here, and uh, and I'm gonna just launch right in since I know time is short and I have a lot to say, and hope we have a discussion. Um, I think it's uh, useful to think about sea level rise, not necessarily something new, but as an acceleration of something that's been happening. And in fact, 50 years ago, the Army Corps of Engineers observed that a vast portion of California's coastal shoreline is constantly being lost by the natural geologic process of erosion. Uh, the Resources Agency said similarly uh, about when we passed our Coastal Act that shoreline erosion problems have plagued California for many years. Many problems still exist and new ones are likely to occur. This was like almost 50 years ago. So here we are with the new problems. And wouldn't it be cool if we had 50 years of management to learn from on across this 50 year erosion trend that we've just gone through? And we do, uh, as most states do. Uh, we started managing the coast in California in 1972. And there was a proposition that got passed and beach protection, the ability to access our beaches was a central reason why we established this management program. <clears throat> and um, one of the ways we did that was uh, over the years was by using the regulatory process to require beach access easements for development permits. So all of these developments, for example, in this stretch of coast in Malibu were required to dedicate the beach in front of the development to the public for access purposes in exchange for the development permit. Uh, we've also got multiple vertical, so-called vertical access ways to enable the public to get from the first public road to the beach. So we have a lot of history of that and we uh, were quite successful in the early years extracting these easements until the Supreme Court got involved in 87 and said, wait a second, maybe you don't have a really good rational connection for doing that kind of regulation. Uh, you can see the chilling effect it had on the Coastal Commission's uh, use of this tool. Nonetheless, there are many of these out there and they've been an important part of protecting beaches for the public over the last 50 years. Uh, let me shift quickly to another piece of this puzzle, which is how we regulated hazards in relationship to beaches. And the law says a couple things. One is that new development must be safe and must never need shoreline protection. So as a matter of course, over the years, the Coastal Commission has used development setbacks to make sure that this is happening and also has put public access in many cases into this area of setback that they've imposed in, for example, this subdivision in Pismo Beach. Uh, they've also done things like re-subdivide existing legal parcels like this case in Monterey where multiple parcels, some which went into the surf zone, were reconfigured, moved back in order to protect the beach and the dune system and allow more space for that natural beach to function. And then also uh, we have about three decades now of experience using what might be called rolling easements. So in addition to requiring the setback, uh, let's require the property owner to assume the risk of being in that location, to agree to never build a seawall in the future, and to require removal of that development if and when necessary. And, and so there are a lot of these out there now. Uh, it's still early in the, in the scheme of things as to how these will do in the courts, but we do have some cases where they've been implemented. So this is an example from Santa Barbara, where the Bacara Resort here in the background uh, had a beach house it became endangered. This was temporary erosion protection. It's now been removed recently because of a condition on the original 1980s permit for the hotel that said, you will need to remove that when it becomes endangered. Uh, what remains to be seen is what will happen with the hotel, which in my interpretation has the same condition. So that should be an interesting story in the future. Uh, on occasion, the commission has 
uh, actually recommended denial of redevelopment on the beach. In this case, this is the location of a house that was recommended to be denied because it would be a public nuisance to the, the beach resources there and the public. This shot was taken in the aftermath of the recent storms we had. So you can see it's a very active location, uh, all this sea foam coming up. So in addition to the new development policy, we also have a policy for existing development. And this has been much more difficult to deal with because essentially the law says that existing development has certain entitlements to protection. So it's been very hard to resist seawall, uh, cumulative seawall development in urbanized areas. For example, here's a shot of this wonderful uh, cliff along Solana Beach, which has now been gradually transformed in kind of a faux Disneyland vertical wall uh, over time. And we know, have long known the um, impacts, I'm waiting for the slide to advance here, the impacts of uh, seawalls on beaches that Jeff uh, mentioned. Uh, this is a, a good example, a 1940s photo of a very living shoreline, in my opinion, a beach with an active back dune system, uh, which has then been developed. And you can see here with my sophisticated software, my approximation of where the beach should be or the back of the beach. But we also see what happens when you armor the coastline and the beach can't recess. And we have multiple examples of that in California, like this section here where the revetment has made the beach much narrower than it would be or could be. Uh, this example where in 1972 you had a wide continuous sandy beach. Now you have no beach in front of the two homes that have armored themselves and you do have a beach. Look at that where the beach where the shoreline has been allowed to recess naturally. So we know what happens when we build seawalls and the Coastal Commission over the years has quantified that impact uh, and routinely used it in permit conditions as a mitigation measure for seawall development. And one of my uh, favorite examples is this condominium in Monterey where we required a $5.2 million mitigation fee to go to beach access acquisition in the area for the projected recreational value loss of this beach. Uh, this is a shot of that location at a recent king tide. So we know this is going to happen. Uh, we know what the impacts are. Uh, the question is, what do we do about it? Another example that I like from California is um, in the case of Fort Ord, the Army proposed to demolish this structure, which was no longer uh, savable. Uh, we asked the Army to also remove the revetment that had been put there over the years. You can see what it did to the beach and the lack of access in front of the structure. When we removed the revetment, the beach naturally restored itself pretty easily given the former dune environment here. So we know that uh, we can improve things if the conditions are right. In Half Moon Bay, similarly, the commission used its enforcement authority to order the removal of this revetment that was replaced in an emergency situation to protect the 18th green here on the golf course. Uh, removing the revetment restores the beach makes a slightly more challenging golf hole, which is kind of the point of golf anyway, right? Is to play around those hazards. So we, we know uh, how to do certain kinds of things. This is data that Sean had referred to from the Cosmos uh, USGS system, projecting what might happen to the shoreline in Del Mar, for example, with a one meter of sea level rise by 2100. And so sea level rise does present an increasingly problematic accelerating trend. What are we going to do if this development is still here in 2100? There won't be a beach. So that's, you can show that up and down the coast. And so we're confronting this question of the coastal squeeze, conflict with community. How do we strike the right uh, strategy with the beach, what we care about with beaches with respect to the existing development? This was a king tide walk uh, last year. And so we've started to talk about adaptation pathways. What are the triggers for taking action and what are the actions we're going to take? And what's the sequence of those actions? Looking at things along a spectrum from protection to nature-based solutions like this uh, dune covered revetment and replenishment proposed in Malibu, using groins, elevating, managed retreat. What is the right uh, com a combination of interventions and over what sequence and what periods of time. 
I think what critical piece of that pathway thinking is what is your vision for the coast, first of all? What are you trying to accomplish? And so this is uh, a good example, I think, of what the city of Monterey has done in the past with this stretch of coast that was uh, basically mixed commercial development. They had a vision to open up the coast to make it a public beach park, and they did that over about 40 years. No takings of private property, all voluntary acquisitions, and gradually they made this into a beach park. So the vision was what drove their incremental actions over a long period of time. Unfortunately, they didn't know that they this very same area would now have to deal with sea level rise. And they've done this new visioning process where they're asking, do we build the seawall and try to stop the ocean from coming in? Or maybe we consider putting in a viaduct for the public road here and reconfiguring the shoreline. And in this visioning exercise, they emphasize we would have two miles more of new coastline and bike trails, more beaches for recreating. So what are the benefits of a certain kind of reimagined coastline? And it's that imagination, I think, that's critical, but brings us back to this uh, original conflict we had with the Supreme Court and the access easement approach, which is, uh, you know, how do we handle the fact that the tide lines are going to keep moving inland? And if we don't figure out how to offset that chain, that trend, we're going to have some legal conflict around the fact that these, uh, the tide line is intersecting with private property. And this, in fact, is what USGS projects. If the shoreline was left to its own devices where the Nolan house is, this is where it would be uh, inland of the development over time. And we know this is happening because we can see at King Tides today that it's basically a bathtub at that location. So if this is what we're facing with sea level rise, how are we going to counteract that? And one of the things I've been working on is public trust issues as a legal matter. Uh, the Coastal Commission has started to take this up as a condition in their permits as well, meaning uh, not only will you remove the development, but if you become on public trust lands in the future, you will remove that development. There's a lot of potential legal conflict out there in the future if we don't figure out alternatives to how to protect the beach. And so I'm going to end with this um, slide that summarizes a case from uh, the uh, North Pacific, where in federal court, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers brought an action of trespass against these homeowners for revetment on tidelands. The court looked at it and essentially concluded based on common law doctrine that uh, the homeowners uh, do not have a right to permanently fix the property boundary absent consent from the United States, or in this case, the Lumi Nation, which was the trust holder of that beach area. So we've got ourselves in a situation where if push comes to shove, we've got a lot of property owners on one side of the, of the tide line in the public trust area. And not as many property owners on the inland side. And I don't think it's going to be a private property issue. It's going to be a common law question of what is constitutional in the context of common law rights. So I'm going to stop there because there's a lot to talk about in, in terms of uh, what do we do next. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. That was great. And uh, a lot of great, really tangible examples. Uh, helps bring home the problem. Um, well, we've talked here uh, for a little while about a lot about California and maybe uh, it's time to do a little change of venue and uh, look at uh, a little bit of a different place in Hawaii. And for that, I'll uh, turn it over to Lauren Blickley. Thank you so much. And thanks, Charles. You set me up really well for everything that I'm getting ready to talk about. Um, Aloha Kako. My name is Lauren Blickley. I'm the Hawaii Regional Manager with the nonprofit Surfrider Foundation. Surfrider is a coastal advocacy organization, and we are focused on protecting our oceans, our waves, and our beaches for all people through our powerful activist network. Uh, before I get started, I do just want to acknowledge that today I'm presenting from the island of Maui, which is part of the larger territory um, that makes up the Kingdom of Hawaii and are the native and the homelands of Native Hawaiians. Most people, when you think of Hawaii, you think of these large, beautiful sandy beaches of which we do have, but of course our coastal zone is very dynamic here in the islands, um, very seasonally dynamic as well. But even though we have some of these large beaches and even though we see the dynamics at play, uh, 
The reality is, is the majority of our sandy beaches on the islands of Oahu, Kauai, and Maui are chronically eroding. And it's in this context and very similar to the context that Charles was just talking about, that Surfrider has increasingly been concerned about the future of our coastlines, uh, the future of accessing coastlines, but you know, we have to make sure that we have coastlines to access and really focus on coastal protection. And so I wanna spend a little bit of time today to share about a project we've been working on over the last couple of years to specifically think about solutions and address the erosion hazards and improve uh, coastal resiliency while also ensuring that we have robust and healthy coastlines. In addition to the chronic erosion that we have, we know that with sea level rise, we're going to continue to see these erosion hazards increase, uh, you know, thousands of residents being displaced, 65,000 structures as a, I think, probably a low ball estimate that may be chronically flooded. And not only uh, are roads and coastlines becoming impassable, but a lot of public infrastructure being significantly and severely threatened as we continue to see these sea levels rise. So these are very real and present threats that we are dealing with locally. This is a picture from the North Shore of Oahu just uh, pretty recently, this was last year. And it's important to remember, you know, coastal erosion is it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's natural. Of course, it's being exacerbated by climate change and sea level rise. The issue, of course, is what Charles was just talking about. We have built too close to our shorelines, and therefore we're seeing this significant threat to public and private property, as well as the um, increasing loss of our public resources and our public coastlines and beaches. Unfortunately, here in Hawaii, we've largely taken a very reactionary and piecemeal approach uh, to addressing the coastal hazards and shoreline erosion. Uh, increasingly, seeing uh, many homeowners themselves take action into their own hands. And we've largely had this perspective of we need to harden the shoreline. We need to, quote unquote, protect, protect, protect. And when we talk about protect in this context is typically protecting, again, that public or that private property. So in addition to you know, those kind of jerry-rigged sandbags and tarps that we consistently see on the North Shore and other places of Hawaii, we also have a legacy of uh, shoreline hardening with seawalls. And the unfortunate thing, again, is if we don't have this shift in perspective, if we don't take a more proactive approach, we're very likely going to continue to see exacerbated erosion throughout the islands and continued loss of our shorelines. Luckily in Hawaii, when you are talking about from a context of coastal preservation and protecting beaches, we do have a number of very strong laws um, and support for public beach access and public beach protection. Uh, as you see in that first bullet point, beaches are a public trust in Hawaii and the state is constitutionally obligated to protect them. Over the last couple of years, we've also had a number of very important policies that have been passed to further support beach protection including a prohibition on any additional shoreline hardening, including seawalls, as well as most recently, a bill that uh, went into effect in May 2022 that requires buyers of coastal property to actually sign a disclosure agreement that acknowledges the risk of buying homes within the coastal zone. Now, we have way more challenges uh, in terms of coastal adaptation and resiliency in Hawaii than just these that I listed out. But I think if, as especially from a community-based perspective, if I'm thinking about challenges we've gone through in the last couple of years of really trying to improve resiliency within the coastal zone and support um, protecting our, our beaches, these are the two big ones that have come up. First, that very unlike California, Hawaii has a bifurcated coastal zone. So it is split in that jurisdiction between the state and county. And I think that's created a lot of major issues and challenges in terms of enforcement with different laws and regulations within the coastal zone. It's also created challenges in terms of creating those proactive plans because now you're dealing with multiple agencies, multiple jurisdictions uh, on, on multiple different levels. And that, again, just creates more red tape and more challenges. And it's easier to sort of kick the can down the road. We also don't have any mechanisms or not many mechanisms. Our, our toolkits are pretty small in terms of uh, financing or policies that can actually help us move away from the shoreline in some of these really vulnerable areas. 
those are, are two big gaps that we've kind of been delving into. So what do we do? You know, that's the million dollar question. And part of the reason I think that we're all here today, and there's obviously not a single solution and one size fits all. But increasingly, as we're seeing these additional erosion hazards, as we're seeing the loss of our shorelines and the threats to the private property, and as surf, surf riders gotten more involved with this throughout the islands, you know, we've connected more with our team and friends at Sea Grant and really started to try to, it was around, I guess, mid-2020, um, and started putting our heads together about how do we address these immediate threats? Again, North Shore of Oahu, not the only place in Hawaii that's having these challenges, but where could we really focus our efforts? Where could we kind of get the biggest bang for our buck? Where are we seeing immediate threats, um, you know, individual property owners that could utilize tools and support? And where are there op opportunities and options to improve these coastlines? Um, maybe it be through dune restoration. And so we essentially kind of settled on the North Shore of Oahu. And for those of you who are not familiar with the islands, here's a map overview. And our focus area was on the North Shore, which has come to the news recently, if you're a surfer. And essentially, our areas stretch from Ka'ina Point all the way up to Kahuku Point. Uh, and again, when you look at this map, you probably see uh, and familiar with some of the names of these very iconic surf breaks. This is probably one of the most iconic shorelines in the entire world. And not only that, but there's a uh, significant and cultural and traditional values along the stretch of coastline for Native Hawaiians. So there's a lot of um, important factors at play along this coastline, which is another reason we thought it was a really important starting point um, and, and pilot area for us to uh, figure out some solutions. And so we came together with our partners at Sea Grant and SSFM International, and we convened what we called the North Shore Coastal Resilience Working Group. And ultimately, it was our goal within this group to just sit down and let's talk as stakeholders and community members uh, about solutions. What do these solutions look like? What's feasible? What can we happen on these different timeframes? And how do we really ensure that we're protecting you know, this iconic coastline for years in the future? We had a series of six meetings that wrapped up in summer of 2022. And you can see there, I bulleted out our topics for each of those meetings. And thank you so much again, Charles, for covering a little bit of the adaptation pathways. Uh, we started off wanting to have five meetings and we got so involved in this adaptation pathways exercise that we ended up adding another meeting. Uh, and essentially adaptation pathways, you know, they are these planning tools that allows us to evaluate these different uh, solutions and various solutions over that phase time scale. And like Charles mentioned, with certain triggers, uh, maybe that's the high wash of the waves or a specific amount of sea level rise that happens that that's triggering these different actions. And we saw quite a bit of strong support uh, for those phase adaptation options and talking about adaptation in a phase manner. And I, another important part of the adaptation pathways is that community collaboration and, and input. And so I uh, wanted to highlight those efforts. We released our final report for this working group in October. You can download a copy at the website you see at the bottom of the screen there. And within the final report, we identified three key hotspots throughout this stretch of coastline and areas that we thought would be most effective to, to focus on first um, that had the most immediate concerns and opportunities. We also laid out some of our adaptation uh, pathways planning, as well as identified some critical concerns and recommendations. I wanted to give a snapshot of our one of our adaptation pathways exercise. Again, you can find this in our final report. And for those of you who are experts in adaptation pathways, you're probably like, oh, well, I don't see the triggers, right? We, we ended up not adding and assigning triggers to each of these different strategies. We just we didn't have the expertise, we didn't have the capacity to do that part of the exercise. But I think what was really important is that we were able to sit down as a group and we outlined for these, these different um, timelines, and I'm just showing the intermediate timeline right now, but we, you know, we went to midterm and also longer term term timelines. And we sat down and were able to talk uh, very candidly about different strategies. 
And then also those identifying those needs and next steps for each strategies. So this was a good um, exercise to not only, again, identify the strategies, but now assigning whether it's some of these are for surf rider, some of these are specific to maybe state and local county agencies, but we have next steps identified. So this was a, a really important um, exercise that our group went through. We also identified and laid out a number of critical concerns, and I'm not going to go through each one of them, but in summary, you know, really considering that this is an immediate issue. This is not an issue where we can kick the can down the road. We literally, during the middle of our meetings, um, had the house, you saw it a few slides back, slide into the ocean at Rocky Point. Like these, this is happening. The lives are at risk, properties at risk, public infrastructure is at risk. And so we need to be addressing this now. The other piece of our critical concerns also revolves around kind of what I touched on before, the lack of this toolkit, you know, we don't have a lot of options from either a homeowner's perspective or a public and state and local agency perspective in terms of how do we really support um, increased coastal resiliency in these areas through proactive planning, which in many cases does also include managed retreat. So we laid out a number of recommendations for immediate action as well. Again, most of these revolving around the need for proactive planning, the need to increase our toolkit when it comes to being able to exit um, these really critical and vulnerable coastal areas, uh, creating comprehensive strategies. And I highlighted that first one because our state legislative session just kicked off and there this is actually an active bill right now. So we've also seen from the release of this report, a number of our state and, and local officials uh, really clumping on to these recommendations, seeing this high priority need, and then supporting it through various legislation. So it's going to be a very active legislative session for us here in Hawaii. And I also highlighted the last one because I think that expanded community discussions is critical to seeing the success of this um, and continuing the work that we've done as the working group. Uh, so for my last slide, you know, just summing up that in addition to that final report, I think a, a huge outcome was having this informed, uh, these informed community members who could share and go out and talk to their friends and family and, and other community members about what we did within the working group. I also think it was important opportunity for us as working group members to all kind of get a different perspective and to to share these different thoughts, whether it's from the homeowner perspective or from the community perspective or the state and local agencies perspective. Uh, and one of my big hopes that I've always had for this project was that we could utilize it as a template and you know, expand these working groups and, and take it to other locales, whether that's in Hawaii or places on the mainland who may uh, really benefit from having these discussions. So I hope that this can be used for a template uh, in other areas that are experiencing similar challenges. And of course, we didn't solve all of all of the issues on the North Shore, or all of the coastal erosion issues in Hawaii, but it was a really important starting point that we believe um, has already led, we've already seen some action taken from it and continue to see that detailed evaluation and, and planning. That's it. Great, thank you, Lauren. Uh, lots of great examples there as well. And I, I, I think uh, sets a nice stage for a discussion of uh, some of the practical tools for dealing with both uh, uh, the permitting and the regulations are around beach structures and uh, migration pathways. Uh, and I think uh, that our next speaker will have uh, some thoughts on that. So I'll turn it over to Travis Brandon. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, thanks to everyone on the panel. This has been uh, really uh, inspiring. I've, I've learned a lot today. Uh, for my talk, I want to focus in somewhat narrowly. We've talked a lot about the importance of uh, armoring or the negative consequences of shoreline armory. And I want to focus in on the uh, regulation of coastal armoring here in the southeast where I'm located uh, and talk, use that as a you know, spring point for some of the larger implications for regional coastal management. Um, and actually, let me see if I can get this to go forward. There we go. 
Um, so I, I wanted to start by kind of pulling out a data point from the read ahead materials, which is that uh, at the moment, 14% of the nation's coastline is armored, and that if current trends continue, we're looking at something like 30% uh, by 2100. Uh, here in the South, given the topography, uh, large areas of, of the Gulf are already armored in this kind of bathtub fashion. So I think we're a little bit ahead of the curve there. But thinking nationwide, like how is that armoring going to happen? Uh, it's going to happen it, unless we change uh, the way that we work in a kind of parcel by parcel and permit by permit uh, approach by private landowners. So one important step in trying to figure out how to have a sustainable uh, coastline that's not fully armored is thinking about how to get to grips uh, with the question of permitting coastal armoring and development. Uh, so I want to look at how here in the southeast federal and state permitting interact. Uh, and how some weaknesses in our permitting systems in the region uh, tend to facilitate armoring. I'm going to start by looking very quickly at uh, one federal policy that uh, encourages and endorses coastal armoring here in the Southeast, uh, which is the Army Corps' Nationwide Permit 13. Uh, and then I'm going to do kind of a broad overview of coastal regulation here in the Southeast and highlight across several states uh, some weaknesses and areas of concern uh, that um, uh, make armoring more likely uh, in the region. And, and the bigger takeaway, I think, here, and probably gesturing towards some of our discussion here, is that I think as we're looking at the Southeast, given some of the challenges in our permitting programs, uh, that what looking forward, if we're going to avoid a coastline that looks like this, uh, we're going to need some more federal planning uh, and funding uh, in order to support region-wide initiatives. I'm not sure that we have the state uh, level will to do that. All right, so I, I want to start by looking very quickly at the Army Corps' role in permitting coastal armoring structures. Uh, because uh, a lot of armoring projects occur in intertidal areas or coastal wetlands, they often implicate the Army Corps' jurisdiction under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. Uh, Section 404 requires permits for fill projects like coastal armoring. Uh, and I want to focus in in particular on uh, Section 404E, uh, which authorizes general permits. The ideas behind the general permit program is that these permits are meant to streamline permitting uh, for activities that cause only minimal adverse environmental effects. One of the general permits that the Army Corps has authorized is Nationwide Permit 13, uh, which allows for bank stabilization activities in the form of riprap, uh, revetments, or bulkheads. Uh, and we've already talked a lot about the problems uh, with armoring, uh, but suffice it to say, I think it's a stretch to say that even small armoring projects have minimal adverse environmental effects. But I want I want to highlight two features of Nationwide Permit 13 that can make it particularly troublesome. The first is that unlike other nationwide permits that authorize more intensive development, Nationwide Permit 13 doesn't require a pre-construction notice or PCN uh, before proceeding with construction. So the, the PCN is a document you submit to the local district uh, engineer of the Army Corps, which provides a basic description of the project and lets the engineer determine whether the project fits uh, the terms of the general permit. So without a PCN requirement, it's a lot harder for district engineers to gather data on the usage of the permit and ensure compliance. Uh, second, uh, Permit 13 puts a federal stamp of approval on armoring structures up to 500 feet in length, uh, and that's, you know, that's a lot. That allows for some very large uh, armoring projects uh, going forward with minimal environmental review, depending on the jurisdiction. Uh, and given that a lot of coastal properties are less than 500 feet in length, uh, it facilitates this kind of parcel-by-parcel -parcel process of creating this kind of bathtub effect. Now, Permit 13, it's important not to overstate its importance. There are a lot of jurisdictions uh, where local regulations uh, are stricter than this uh, and require more review. Uh, but here in many areas of the Southeast, particularly along the Gulf Coast, uh, Permit 13 plays a significant role in coastal permitting decisions. Uh, Mississippi, for example, has basically adopted Permit 13 uh, for permitting coastal bulkheads. Uh, and it has a lot of influence on permitting bulkheads in coastal wetlands throughout the Southeast, uh, where state restrictions are more uh, lax. The, the Corps estimates that Permit 13 could authorize uh, roughly 18,000 projects, uh, armoring projects over five years. Uh, 
this the ease of uh, permitting under permit 13 has also encouraged hard armoring uh, and discouraged softer uh, erosion controls. Uh, in 2017, uh, the uh, Army Corps adopted a nationwide permit for living shorelines, which are you know, softer armoring options. Uh, but in many jurisdictions, uh, it's still easier to build a bulkhead uh, than a uh, living shoreline uh, because of the restrictions in the nationwide permit for 54 that aren't present in permit 13. So if we're thinking about immediate steps we could take uh, in order to reduce armoring of coasts and wetlands to make it a little, to slow that down a little bit. Uh, one place we could start is the Army Corps should consider eliminating uh, Permit 13 or at least uh, modifying it so that it's at least as strict as Nationwide Permit uh, 54. That said, the Army Corps' facilitation of armoring in the Southeast is just one small part of the, the whole the challenges uh, that we face uh, at the state level. So I wanted to highlight uh, some areas of concern uh, in the region of how we permit development. So the first is a uh, lack of uniformity and responsiveness uh, in the Southeast in how we draw development lines. So uh, most of the Southeastern states rely on a system of setback lines to guide coastal development permits. Uh, those setbacks are you know, jurisdictional lines that identify a boundary uh, where uh, you know seaward development is not permitted. But every state in the region does this somewhat differently, which makes it really hard to do regional planning and thinking. Uh, we've got one group of states, including you know Alabama and Georgia, that use relatively fixed setback lines. Uh, these are setback lines that are drawn from uh, existing land features, such as uh, sand dunes, uh, in some cases, older existing buildings or other kinds of fixed elements of the terrain. The advantage of a fixed setback approach uh, is that it's more uniform. Uh, it's easier for property owners and developers to calculate where it is. Uh, but the huge downside uh, is that it's much slower to change and adapt to erosion and sea level rise. Compounding that problem, uh, many states uh, that use fixed setback lines lack statutory mechanisms to update them. So that can lead to some extreme cases like uh, Alabama's notorious uh, Dauphin Island, where storms and sea level rises have eroded the beach to the point uh, where the legal setback line has long been offshore, uh, meaning that you know anything goes uh, for development. Now, uh, that's obviously pretty extreme, but if states continue to use these kind of fixed setback lines, we're almost certainly going to see more examples like this uh, as sea level rise continues to erode the land that's oceanward uh, of that jurisdictional line. Uh, other states uh, like Florida and South Carolina use a more dynamic approach, uh, applying these localized erosion rates in order to set uh, setbacks. Uh, Florida, for example, uses a 30-year uh, erosion projection based on erosion and storm data for the area. I think this is obviously a better uh, approach. Uh, it's more adaptive uh, for providing coastal management. Uh, and it also allows for the incorporation of more and better data, like the improvements uh, to ocean mapping that Sean was just talking about. Uh, so I, I think this is a, a good approach, uh, and, but uh, the problem in these states is that they uh, only update those erosion rates infrequently. Uh, so South Carolina, the erosion rates are only updated every seven to 10 years. Florida does so as a discretionary uh, action when authorities determine uh, that changes in the data have rendered the old setback line uh, ineffective. So having this kind of uh, decade-long gap in updating erosion rates uh, is way too slow uh, to respond effectively to the problems caused by rising seas. Uh, there's also, because of the, the gap and because of the significance of that recalculation of erosion rates, uh, this process of updating erosion data becomes highly politicized uh, because it threatens the interests of coastal developers. And, and that leads to a second sort of worrying trend when it comes to coastal permitting in the region, which is that there has been, uh, you know, wherever states, uh, even if they have good retreat or uh, beach management policies in place, uh, when uh, push comes to shove uh, and developers start having permits denied, uh, there, there's been a tendency to kind of back down. So just to pick a couple of examples, uh, in 2016, North Carolina, uh, which has all in all a, a pretty good uh, coastal management program in place, uh, 
uh, started allowing local governments uh, the authority to establish uh, at a local level their own development lines for permitting. Uh, and unsurprisingly, in many cases, that led to development closer to the beach and closer to that uh, erosion. North Carolina also has a, a ban on hard coastal armoring, uh, but it routinely undermines that uh, policy by permitting the installation of temporary sandbags uh, for emergency erosion control. Uh, in some places, these sandbags have been in place for 30 years. Uh, similarly, uh, South Carolina in 2018 uh, revised its Beach Management Act to remove all references to the, the previous policy of retreat that used to be part of the statute uh, and replace them with a policy of beach preservation, uh, which means you know holding the line. This is a process that's ongoing in South Carolina. Uh, the legislature is th currently threatening to wipe out all of the existing uh, coastal management regulations unless the Department of Health and Environmental Control updates them to focus on that preservation mandate. Uh, so lots of other examples uh, throughout the Southeast, but I probably don't need to tell you uh, that state politics in the South are not currently favorable uh, to long-term regional environmental planning. Finally, uh, several uh, Southeastern states uh, have uh, policies that facilitate coastal armoring, uh, such as actively uh, encouraging filling in uh, gaps in coastal armoring. Uh, so Florida is the most notable of these, both because of how aggressive uh, the statute is uh, regarding this gap filling policy and also how large and important uh, its coastline is. So uh, Florida largely exempts uh, bulkheads, seawalls, and riprap from permitting, uh, where it's used to uh, fill in the gaps between existing armoring. This creates a kind of chain reaction where once a few owners get uh, hard armoring permits, uh, all of their neighbors follow suit. So looking at uh, all of these policies and looking across uh, the Southeast, I, I just want to conclude in a way that kind of, I think gestures forward to some of what we were planning to talk about as a panel. Uh, what I think that these examples illustrate is that perhaps especially here in the Southeast, where we have so many different jurisdictions and so many different interests at play, uh, we're going to have a real hard time solving the problem of ongoing armoring uh, or coastal development at a permit by permit level. Uh, and I think that's especially true, as, as Charles talked about with the uh, uh, the Supreme Court the way that it is. Uh, so I think that the only solution here, the only way that we're going to get to long-term sensible beach planning uh, is through some uh, federal intervention here. We need some sort of um, you know, uh, comprehensive uh, beach plan uh, and coastal planning. And I think that the only realistic mechanisms here in the Southeast are that that happens through, for example, the Coastal Zone Management Act uh, and others. Um, we also need to uh, uh, change our funding incentives, uh, which, you know, in the Southeast, we deal with a lot of hurricanes uh, and stop focusing our disaster funding on rebuilding uh, and put more into uh, buyout programs uh, and also uh, changing the way that we manage uh, federal uh, flood insurance. Uh, so uh, I will uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that some more in the discussion. So I will hand it back uh, to Jeff there. Well, thank you, Travis. That was great. And um, I really appreciate the careful distinctions you made between the various types of permitting at the state and federal and local level. Uh, and I do want to uh, just wrap up this portion of the webinar by giving um, all the panelists a chance. Uh, if there was something uh, that you'd like to say in conclusion or something that another speaker said that uh, prompted you to want to add something that Maybe this would be the time to, to, to take care of that. Well, hearing none, let's go right into the second question, the second sort of section of the webinar. And this is kind of a general uh, discussion among the panel of a couple of kind of key questions. And let's start with the one that Travis raised a minute ago, uh, the state uh, coastal zone management programs. And the good news is that some state CZMA programs do look at beaches and dunes uh, with the idea of having uh, their protection uh, in mind. 
but some do not. Uh, and so one question to the panel is, uh, what role should the CZMA program play in adapting the nation's beaches to more severe storms and rising seas? And for example, should uh, the national program require that each state add to their existing plans a, a new element focused specifically on sustaining beaches? Anyone want to start with that? I see Charles, yes, what? raising your hand. I'll, I'll take a start at it, but uh, I think that's a really challenging question. And, um, you know, I alluded that at the outset of my presentation that all, all the states, mo or most of the states, have basically a 50 year history of coastal management under the CZMA, which has largely been uh, process oriented and funding oriented. So, in California, anyway, the most important uh, regulation was happening at the state and local level and that relationship between them. The federal government was providing broad guidance and support uh, and funding to our program. So uh, I think it would be interesting to start tying the funding to more substantive outcomes, perhaps like protection of beaches or beach sustainability. But I think that would be pretty challenging to get through at the federal level. Um, you know, especially when you look at contrast between a place like California and North Carolina, for example, uh, where it's pretty dramatic in terms of how people perceive uh, what the issues are and how to deal with them. Um, at the same time, as I talked about, we've, we've had a hard time with seawalls ourselves. So uh, it's, it's a complicated policy question and to establish substantive goals and at the federal level would be an interesting political discussion, and I, I can't imagine it um, resolving itself in in favor of beaches, uh, not necessarily against beaches, but you know, in our current state, you know, how does anything get resolved? Asking that question, oh, you know, even in Santa Cruz, uh, couple, last week when the president was here looking at the damage, the lead-in from the national news was. You know, how are we going to uh, protect, better protect and harden our infrastructure? It's not about saving beaches. Anyone else on the panel like to speak to the coastal zone management program question? Yeah, I mean, I'll just echo what Charles was saying and that I agree that there, there are some significant political uh, obstacles to making any progress on that at the federal level, particularly at this moment. Uh, but I do think that, you know, in terms of thinking and long term vision, I think the Coastal Zone Management Act is perhaps uh, underappreciated uh, in terms of ways that it could we could leverage those questions of federal funding. There's a lot of federal funding that goes to uh, uh, states in terms of uh, dealing with their coastal zones. Uh, and I think to the extent that we we could condition them uh, on, you know, more progressive policies uh, that the Coastal Zone Management Act is, you know, offers the opportunity to do that in a way that perhaps has been somewhat underappreciated. Now, whether we can actually put that into play, uh, I, I similarly have my doubts. I, I agree with that just briefly. I, I don't want to undersell the CZMA. I think it is underappreciated. Well, maybe we should turn to one of the other big federal uh, investments now in, in beach management, which essentially amounts, many of you have mentioned, several of you have mentioned, uh, related to beach nourishment, uh, adding sand to sustain a beach. Uh, in general, do uh, any of you have suggestions for how that federal program might be improved? And what uh, would you think of a suggestion that uh, future beach nourishment projects be tied to a requirement for also identifying a landward migration corridor and taking steps to be sure that the dunes that were sustaining the beaches that were protecting can move landward as sea levels rise. Okay, Charles, if you're in tech, take a stab at that one, great. Um, 
You know, I, I think um, my my thinking on beach replenishment has evolved a little bit, but uh, you know, I look to what's been happening in places like Florida and North Carolina and New Jersey, and and wonder about the long term prospects of that. And even in Southern California, where we spend a lot of money putting sand periodically in the same places, only to have it disappear. And it raises a lot of issues for me about how we pay for that and who pays for it, especially if it's not coupled to longer term uh, policy goals like you suggest. And so I've been thinking about it uh, in terms of a combination of strategies that might be considered over time in connection to these longer term movements or adaptation pathways. So. For example, um, revisiting the question of groins, which have not been favorably looked on in California since we started proactively regulating, but do play a role in trapping sand and maintaining beach environments for longer periods, if done appropriately and in a way that doesn't affect down coast jurisdictions. So maybe a strategically placed groin with with sand retention, not even necessarily replenishment, but allowing the natural forces to build up sand is a good interim step while you plan and put in place the mechanisms that Lauren was saying we don't really have yet, and which we've been trying to get in California too, to provide for managed retreat in a way that isn't threatening, that allows for voluntary and acquisition and movement over time to allow a beach environment to maybe persist longer. Um, but I think it's really complicated as to what kinds of things are going to work where and how much they will cost and who is going to pay for them. And so that's partly the importance of what I heard Lauren talking about in terms of a more a smaller scale, sub-regional, community-based planning process to look at those kinds of trade-offs. Do you have thoughts on that, Lauren? I see your camera's on. Yeah, the managed retreat issue has has been a really big discussion point. And I think that we're grappling with exactly, you know, what I brought up in, in the presentation. And then also, you know, this this very real feeling of homeowners of, you know, this is my home. What do we do? And what do we do, particularly now in light of the fact that their actions are then taking away this public trust? So this is it's it's really contentious. It's really hard discussions that we've had to have. And I think it's also important. That's why we drew it down to this community base level. And I like what you said, you know, this the sub regional community base level. So we could sit there as neighbors and not just the state or the county and talk through some of these things. And it was really interesting because some of those homeowners were saying, if I would, if I could get a buyout, I would take it, you know? And, and this is a homeowner who's been there since the sixties. Um, and, and one of those houses that was on the, on the um, photos that I showed. So I think that there's, there's a will in some cases, but we don't have the tools yet. So we've actually been looking at California for some of those tools. And I think that's uh, New Jersey, the Blue Acres buyout program is something we've been looking at. Um, and it's so challenging because when people also think of managed retreat, they think of a single policy, but it's not, it's a series of policies. It's a series of tools. It's a series of different funding mechanisms. So you want you know, state and local funding, but you also want, you know, potentially federal funding. And maybe there's a, a there's a lot of different ways to do it. We're looking at um, special community districts, special finance districts that maybe we could apply to certain areas, such as the North Shore, um, where people who are in certain areas are paying more, maybe in terms, not necessarily a property tax, but some level of, of tax that then goes into funds to support uh, certain levels of buyout. So, I think that's an important consideration too, is, is it's easy to blanket. We want managed retreat, but the reality is, is it's, um, it's multi-layered, multifaceted. It requires a number of different policies and a number of different funding mechanisms. Great, thank you. I, well, I think that was uh, 
Well said, uh, Jeff. Just on the California option, we have had a bill in the legislature the last two years to uh, allow local governments to uh, basically borrow money to acquire hazardous properties and then lease them back to uh, residential use until such time as they're no longer viable. Uh, went through the legislature two years in a row. The governor vetoed it two years in a row uh, because I think of the sensitive political conversation around buying out residential homeowners. Uh, but there is movement in that direction, but I agree it, it takes time to unfold. And it's not like we haven't used um, pro property laws under the Constitution to take property before for many other things like highways. Uh, and so it's something that's provided for. The ideas of acquiring property for the public interest are out there. But how do you do it? How do you make it happen over time so that people who are there now aren't immediately threatened by these policy, policy ideas? And you have a rational way to get there. All right. Well, great. Thank you. Uh, let's close uh, the discussion, panel discussion portion of the webinar and uh, take some questions from the audience. We have quite a lot of them uh, and we'll try and get to a bunch of them here. Uh, I, I think maybe there's there's been some interest in the questions in, in the uh, USGS work related to uh, the Cosmos uh, planning tool that Sean talked about and uh, when that might be available for the Hawaiian Islands and for Louisiana. Maybe Sean, you could speak to that. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, uh, we have a pretty complicated timeline for the different regions. Um, you know, we have a pretty extensive data review process process that, that goes into all of these um, model projections, which makes it difficult to say when specifically one product might be available. Um, for, the, for the South Atlantic, for Miami through Delaware, we're hoping that we will have flood projections and erosion projections and vertical land motion projections and groundwater flooding projections available within a few weeks, potentially months. Um, so that's the, the Atlantic side. Um, on the Gulf side, you know, I, I think for the Gulf, for Hawaii and for the Pacific Northwest, we're probably looking realistically at about a timeline of um, one or two years away. Um, and then Alaska will probably be on the order of three years away. And then if we work on New England or the Great Lakes, that would probably be on the order of four or five years away. Um, but, you know, if there's if there's a strong interest in a particular area, you know, please feel free to contact me um, or, you know, my supervisor, Patrick Barnard, who's kind of in charge of the overall Cosmos project, you know, whereas, whereas I, focus on the coastal erosion side of things, but we have other components, which I think are, are equally important in terms of overall coastal hazard vulnerability, like flooding projections and groundwater hazard projections. Um, in, in many low-lying coastal regions, um, you know, I think groundwater flooding hazards are going to be tremendously impactful. Um, you know, we can, we can build as much as we want the beaches and dunes, but it's just going to go through the groundwater, uh, unless we're pumping constantly. Um, so those, those multi-hazard, uh, projections, I think are really important in all of this. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, with a timeline, you know, we're, we're hoping to cover most of the, the sort of open coastal areas within a time frame of of two to three years, hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, subject to our 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 review process. Okay, great. I think that covers the question. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat about uh, financing and 
uh, the success that local or state governments have had with financing either property buyouts or uh, establishing setback corridors, um, that kind of question. And um, I think looking for, are there examples that you would point to that maybe haven't come up yet? Um, Lauren, you mentioned the Blue Acres program um, and the lack maybe of financing right now in Hawaii that would, would be something that needs work. Um, does anyone on the panel want to add uh, any ideas on that topic? Uh, I'll just say on on financing that uh, a lot of our the sort of managed retreat that we've seen in the United States uh, has taken place through the FEMA buyout program. So FEMA through the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program uh, finances uh, buyouts. I think that the Blue Acres program was was related to that, uh, and now has the uh, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities or BRIC uh, program is a relatively new one. Uh, and I think that these are, are programs that have a lot of potential uh, for targeted buyouts in areas that are subject to routine flooding, uh, for example. One concern I want to raise, uh, like Charles, I, I think quite rightly talked about the power of eminent domain uh, when it comes to buyouts, but there's also sort of an unpleasant history in the United States of uh, displacing uh, socially vulnerable communities in uh, buyouts. And, and one thing, you know, that's a concern for me is that as we move forward, I think we are inevitably going to see and need more buyout programs. It's very important that they be designed in ways uh, that uh, uh, provide for the needs of socially vulnerable uh, communities. And looking at the history of FEMA buyout programs, there have been some studies recently showing how uh, they raise, you know, that they raise some important social justice concerns. Uh, and tend to uh, uh, direct a disproportionate share of money to uh, wealthier and wider communities. Uh, and I think that that's, it's, it's important that we find ways to make sure as we do move forward with plans of relocation and realignment uh, to make sure that we're incorporating those kinds of social justice concerns. And Jeff, I think that's that's a reason why we need to do that kind of thinking within the, the larger planning context and, in, and at the community scale, because uh, it's, it's, it's part of a strategy and a vision for the future of the shoreline in the community. It's If you're just implementing a kind of piecemeal targeted buyout after the fact, after the repetitive flooding or emergency action, you're prone to that kind of bias, I think, as opposed to deciding what do we want to be and how are we going to pay for it or get there? Um, so we've got lots of other kinds of financing mechanisms out there in the world of wetland restoration. You probably talked about them last week. Like the Bay Area has a property fee for every county ringing the Bay to pay for wetland restoration and retreat options over time. They're raising millions of dollars to do that. A financing district uh, is also an option in shoreline hazard abatement, which is on the table and now in effect in state law in California too, which is to establish a special district like Lauren was referring to that would come along with funding to achieve the goals of that district in an equitable way. Yeah, I'm glad you already brought up the equity because that's been something that we've also been discussing quite a bit in Hawaii. And one of the big points of discussion is, you know, why are we buying out these coastal homeowners for millions of like, these are multi-million dollar homes. Why are we buying them out? And that's a question I feel like I've also had to sit with on a personal level over the last couple of years and, and thinking about those trade-offs, which I think is really different depending on which area of coastline you're at as well. But like, you know, in it, what we're seeing on the North shore and a lot of places in Hawaii, the alternative is that we're losing our public beaches but doing it in a way and, and, and having the buyout structured in a way that you are prioritizing um, and you're making sure to prioritizing the social environmental justice aspects. Um, and so that's someone asked in the chat, you know, do we need to triage? Absolutely. We're going to have to triage, but we're also going to have to add in these, these different 
mechanisms again to ensure um, we are talking again about structuring pot we, we didn't introduce the bill this year we're still trying to figure out again we took from california's bill i've read that bill the managed retreat bill quite a bit and how we could apply that in hawaii and what we were also saying is could we have some sort of like uh, stepwise approach where you know the first box is the priorities go to in case of potential buyouts you know two native hawaiians and then to um, a certain level of, of income or a certain level of, of house. And like, what, what does that look like as uh, you get down to you are prioritizing, um, but then you also have to triage, of course. So, you know, identifying those areas, particularly these very specific spots, like we identified in our, our hot spots. I think that was important in our coastal working group here are the hot spots. Like these, these are the first places along this stretch of coastline that we need to focus these efforts on. So I think it is a mix of triage. I think it's a mix of um, ensuring that you have community buy-in and a community vision. That's huge. That's what Charles was just getting at. What is that that vision? And I loved your example of Monterey. I think that's I think creating that vision so it doesn't just feel like oh we're just buying out rich people on the coastline. You know, what's what's the long term vision in this area? And and Jeff, just one other comment on that. I noticed a question about ecology, which we haven't touched on much, but I think that has to be part of the triage, too, which is, you know, what where are the places we should be really prioritizing for the ecological values and functions of beaches? And, you know, that's the conflict between ecology and people a lot of times. So it's not just about you know, finding the right places for the public trust use of the resource, but the ecology also. Yes, that was one of the questions I had hoped we'd have time to get to. Uh, unfortunately, we we don't have time to go into it uh, anymore right now. So uh, in closing the webinar, uh, I'd like to say first, uh, thank you to uh, the panelists for a great presentation each one of you. And I think uh, as someone said, I, I've already learned a lot. Uh, so I really appreciate excellent presentations. And thank you also to the Environmental Law Institute for sponsoring the webinar. If anyone in the audience has uh, questions they would like to follow up, uh, feel free to send those along. Uh, we'll post our email addresses. And as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, uh, the webinar is this webinar is part of a two part series on coastal ecosystem resilience to storms and rising seas. Uh, part one addresses coastal wetlands and was held on January 19th. And you can find materials for that on the ELI webinar website. Uh, finally, thank all of you in the audience for joining the webinar. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll say goodbye. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. Just want to give another big thank you to Jeff, Travis, Charles, Lauren, um, and Sean. So thank you so much for being here today. We so appreciate it. Um, we hope you have a great day. <laughs>